Good evening. Thank you all for being here tonight. These events are made truly special because of your attendance and participation. Again, thank you for joining us. And um, uh, to those of you who are with us in person, and through, as well as through our live streaming uh, via our YouTube channel. Welcome to Ripon College and the Center for Politics uh, and the People. I am Henrik Schatzinger, co-director of the center, along with my colleague, Professor Brian Smith, in the background. Brian, please stand up for a second. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I'm also an associate professor of politics and government. Tonight, we're going to discuss the role of the media in the 2016 election, both from the perspective uh, of how the media cover the elections, and also how the campaigns use various types of media. The event is scheduled for 60 minutes, but um, <clears throat> the uh, panelists have kindly agreed that we can go a bit longer uh, if there are more questions from the audience and if we are all enjoying ourselves. I'm, I'm excited that uh, we have three distinguished panelists to discuss the role of the media tonight. Let me introduce them to you. Um, to my far left, we have uh, Charlie Sykes. Mr. Sykes is one of the most influential conservatives in Wisconsin. For the last 22 years, he has also been one of the state's top-rated and most influential talk show hosts, with The Daily Show on WTMJ Radio, based in Milwaukee. Uh, he has also been the host of his own public affairs television show, known as Sunday Insight, on the local NBC affiliate. He is also currently an MSNBC contrib MS contributor. Mr. Sykes has written eight books, and he is the founder and editor-in-chief of the website Write Wisconsin, an online platform for conservative writers and thinkers. As a senior fellow at the Wisconsin Policy Research Institute, he is also the editor of the group's magazine, Wisconsin Interest. Please join me in welcoming Charlie Sykes to our panel. Center, we have Professor Michael Wagner. Professor Wagner is an associate professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the, at the University of uh, Wisconsin Madison. Professor Wagner has published uh, his research in numerous academic journals and books. He is currently completing a book entitled Beyond the Left Right Divide How the Multi Dimensional Character of mass policy preferences affects American politics. It is my understanding that the book will be published uh, this coming spring. He is also a regular contributor to PBS Media Shift and a winner of multiple classroom awards. Michael Wagner has also worked as a political reporter and news anchor in both Illinois and Nebraska. Please join me in welcoming Mike Wagner to our panel. Finally, to my left, we <clears throat> have publisher Tim Like. Mr. Like has been publisher of the Ripon Commonwealth Press since 1990. Previously, he has been editor of Skyway News, Freeway News in the Twin Cities, and was assistant managing editor of the, of the Minnesota Daily at the University of, Wisconsin, of Minnesota Twin Cities. As publisher of Ripon's newspaper, he oversees editorial, advertising, production, and distribution operations. Pretty much, he does it all. <laughs> under, under his leadership, the newspaper staff has beaten 187 other Wisconsin newspapers to earn the Commonwealth the title of best weekly newspaper in Wisconsin for each of the past five years, something that is unprecedented. Please join me in welcoming Tim Light to our panel. Our plan for tonight is as follows. We will begin by engaging all three panelists in a series of questions, and after 25 or 30 minutes, we will open up the conversation to questions from you, the audience, and we will have a microphone here in the center for you uh, to ask questions. So, let the fun begin. Let me start.
start out by making two observations. Uh, first, the organization MediaQuant tries to calculate the value of free or so-called earned media coverage. According to MediaQuant, Donald Trump has received about $4.3 billion of earned media in the last 12 months. This compares to Hillary Clinton's $2.3 billion during the same time period. Second observation is that studies uh, show that uh, an almost perfect correlation between the amount of media coverage and standing in the polls during the Republican primary. Uh, for those of you who are interested in statistics, the correlation is 0.96, which is a really, really strong correlation. So my question for the panelists uh, is, do you think Donald Trump would be the presidential nominee without this disproportionate amount of unpaid media coverage, <clears throat> how much of the free media has uh, enabled Trump? Anybody can? I'll start. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's really nice uh, to be here uh, on this panel. I look forward to learning a lot from uh, everyone in the room. Um, that's a really great question. Um, the so the question was kind of dealing with Trump's ability to win the Republican nomination. During the hottest part of the nominating period, he had had about $2 billion or so of earned media coverage. Um, and at that point, that had sextupled the amount that Ted Cruz had gotten during that same period of time, who was the next closest competitor in terms of earned media um, overall, uh, especially on television in the United States. Um, I would say that I think there were kind of three primary reasons that Donald Trump won the nomination. The first, and I think probably the most important, is that overwhelming amount of coverage. In a primary election, it's much harder to distinguish between the candidates because they broadly agree on policy. It's, it's way easier to go and see an R or a D next to a name and say, well, I'm closer to this side or that, and then make a choice. But when there's 16 people, uh, many of whom are qualified, many of whom are governors of swing states, like Governor Walker and Governor Kasich and Governor Bush, um, who had been governor at one point, you have a lot of qualified people all working to differentiate themselves from each other and introduce themselves to the public, and they had a really challenging time doing that because of the volume of attention that Trump got. And I think the volume is the most important reason that he won the nomination. But I think the other two reasons um, are his performance of the debates. Not that he's a spectacular debater, but that he played by his own set of rules that the other more seasoned politicians didn't seem prepared for. Mr. You know, all politicians in debates will try to speak longer than their allotted time, but they tend not to call names, they tend not to interrupt aggressively, they tend not to shout people down, and it seemed like the more seasoned politicians just weren't prepared for that and made Trump, I think, look strong in the early debates, which only ended up giving him more coverage than he got uh, in, the, in the first place. And so the performance that he gave in the debates strongly affected the volume of coverage he got after the debates. His Twitter performance also does that. When he gets less coverage, he tends to tweet more, and that tends to generate more coverage, especially if those tweets are, are retweeted by uh, his followers out there. And I would say the third reason is that the Republican Party didn't coalesce around anybody else. Usually, the party has a favored candidate who gets the most endorsements very early in the primary season. Mitt Romney had way more endorsements than anyone else in 2012, and even though he struggled in some of the earlier primaries, he had a ton of party insider support. George W. Bush had the same advantage in 2000 over John McCain. John McCain had the same advantage over Mitt Romney in 2008. But in 2016, the parties didn't overwhelmingly select one person or another. Governor Walker, uh, Governor Kasich, Jeb Bush, maybe Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz were all plausible people to give Hillary Clinton a very difficult contest, probably a more difficult contest than she's having, and the party, for one reason or another, didn't coalesce around them. They might have been worried that, well, if we pick Kasich and it's Walker, then that doesn't look so good. And so, you know, there was, I'm not sure why they didn't, but I think those three reasons, led by the news media, drove Trump to the nomination. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having us here, Henrik. And uh, Charlie's written eight books, and Michael is publishing a book, and I've read a whole bunch of books. <laughs> um, 
just for fun, I'll disagree with Michael. I don't think the most important reason that uh, Donald Trump won the nomination was because of the media. I think it was because of what he said and who he is and how he positioned himself. Um, and then the media were helped spur uh, his, his eventual nomination among the 17 people who vied for the Republican nomination. Uh, Donald Trump was, uh, from this newsman's perspective, very colorful, very newsworthy. He was outrageous at times. He was unusually colorful. Uh, and then you couple that with the fact that he positioned himself as the as anti-establishment candidate. Uh, what you had, in, in, in effect, was uh, 16 Republican candidates fishing with uh, fishing poles, and at the end of the poles was a hook with a worm on it, and you had Donald Trump with a bucket of chum just throwing it all around the boat. And then when the sharks came, he said, those nasty sharks, uh, they're corrupt, they're liars. And uh, that made for good copy. So yeah, the media, and, and, and frankly, intuitively, and tell me if that's how you feel, uh, I couldn't look away. I couldn't not watch a Donald Trump rally. Now I kind of had enough. But as my wife will tell you, we often have a DVR set for CNN when he was speaking at Louisville or Cincinnati or, or many times in Ohio, uh, I couldn't look away because you never knew what he was going to say. And when you're a newsman or a newswoman, that's golden. That's a scoop. That advances the narrative. Uh, and he had to set himself apart from the other 16, and he did it brilliantly. Uh, so the media were willing accomplices, and there was certainly a, 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 a symbiotic relationship between the media and, and Donald Trump because, of course, Donald Trump would be colorful and that would bring more eyes, more eyes or higher ratings and higher ratings for more money, and you know all that, but, uh, and then, of course, Donald Trump got more time and more coverage and eventually more votes. He got plurality in those states and he got the nomination because he set himself apart and the media couldn't look away. Let me answer this question in a couple of ways, um, and I may step on some of the future questions. But Donald Trump basically broke the, the news media in this country. Um, the news media in this country was not set up to handle someone like Donald Trump. Uh, it may be for three reasons. Number one, they never dealt with somebody who lied with so much felicity or so frequently. Um, he also had the benefit of, of um, a media, a media infrastructure that would then cover for and rationalize his lies, and apparently an electorate that is uh, willing to accept or does not care uh, about, his, about his conduct. And then, of course, you have the deep cynicism of the media that played upon exactly what uh, we're talking about, the, the, the realization that people could not take their eyes off of this. And what we saw, and people, I think, have been talking about this for, for decades, the decision by the media basically to turn over their airwaves, particularly uh, electronic media, obviously, uh, to turn over their airwaves to unedited, just infomercials for Donald Trump, that they would cover his, his rallies, his speeches, basically wall to wall without any sort of fact checking, without any sort of journalism. Basically, the journalists uh, turned over their airtime. Now, why? Well, the president of CBS News said, um, Donald Trump may be bad for America, but he is good for CBS. He is good for ratings. And this clearly drove much of the coverage. The number is really stunning when you think about it, that, that essentially got $4 billion worth of free coverage. Now imagine being one of the other candidates in, the, in this race who is trying to have a substantive, reasonable, civil uh, approach to this campaign. They simply could not get and or compete with that kind of airtime. Um, I know the phrase earned media is used. I, it's free airtime. It's, uh, they, they, they just gave it away. Uh, and so Donald Trump basically um, was, was anointed by being given this incredible gift. Now, why did the, the media do this? Well, I've had this conversation with, uh, with many people in the electronic media, and many of them will say, well, it, it was like watching you know, the Hindenburg explosion, and, and we figured, um, we didn't think we were doing him a favor because we figured, oh my goodness, he's saying these incredibly outrageous things. I mean, on any given day, he's gonna be insulting Mexicans, he's gonna be insulting women, he's gonna be insulting fat people or POWs, or he's gonna say something else that, that is gonna cause him to implode. And we believe 
that if people actually saw this, they would go, oh, okay, this guy is like, he's, he's, he's bizarre, he's, uh, he's surreal. Um, but it did not happen. And what happened is that we realized that we had the blending of our reality TV celebrity culture into political journalism. But um, I, 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 I have a hard time imagining that Donald Trump would have gotten this nomination if he had not received you know, multiples of attention, if, if, if in fact he would have one of the other candidates who had received you know, similar, uh, again, he's way more entertaining for a variety of, of reasons. Um, but this is one of the stories, and I think it is an abdication of responsibility on the part of the news media, and we'll look back on it as one of many failures of the news media in this particular election year. Thank you very much. Uh, let me transition to the big elephant in the room, so to speak, uh, which is uh, media bias or media fairness. Uh, I know many of you care about this, uh, this issue. And Donald Trump has repeatedly stated that the media have been treating him unfairly and that the media are biased uh, toward Clinton. In his own words, Trump has said that the media are, quoting, disgusting, crooked, dishonest, and corrupt and that the overall media coverage of him has been a disgrace. So, my question to you, and maybe also in the context of uh, the recent, you know, the first presidential debate, we can, you know, look at, like, the moderation of the debate. Was that an example of media bias one way or the other? Um, how fair do you think have the mass media been in covering Donald Trump and also Hillary Clinton? Okay, you've got the primary campaign, and you've got initially 17 Republican candidates. The story is going to be the horse race. You know that. You cannot talk to 17 candidates and say, tell me about the genesis of ISIS and what's happening in Syria and Putin versus Obama in relation to Syria and do it in 30 seconds. It can't happen. So it ends up being who's ahead, who do the people like, which is a weird thing to be asking when you haven't really told them how the 17 distinguish themselves between each other. Uh, so you've got the primary, and it, and it really is the horse race. And frankly, and this is a whole other topic, but maybe that's what we want at that point, because we want to bet on the winning horse. We want to go with the winner. We want our party to win. So if Trump is in the lead and Clinton's in the lead, <coughs> they're the sure thing. But then you have post convention, and, and, and it's a whole different story. Um, what is bias? It's bias news that challenges your predisposition. If that's the case, there probably hasn't been enough bias in this general election, because uh, there hasn't been enough challenges of people who will make statements about what they plan to do and don't tell you how they plan to do it. And if you watch and you, and you really analyze what's being said by the candidates and watch the reporters and how they drill down or try to drill down or sometimes don't drill down at all when their question isn't answered, it's interesting because there's a whole game going on. And uh, in the morning I watch uh, Andrew Cuomo and New Day on CNN and, and he'll interview somebody who was, he doesn't, uh, Trump won't go there anymore and Clinton's never gone there. But, He'll ask a question, or you can chuck Todd on MSNB or on, on uh, Meet the Press or, or pick, your, pick your person, but they'll ask the question, and of course, uh, uh, Mike Pence is good at this. They'll answer the question in a related way, but not really answer the question. And then the reporter will come back and say, no, no, I asked you this. And again, they'll discuss the topic, but not answer the question. And they'll do it a second or third time if they're, if they're, if they're decent. Sometimes they'll just, sometimes, Good morning, America. They will take whatever answer you give them and go on to the next question, like they never even heard the answer and never realized the question wasn't answered. But if if they drill down and don't get the answer for the third or fourth time, now you're going to start to hear reporters uh, say or interviewers say, "I guess we'll agree that you're not going to answer the question for now." And that's unfortunate. I, I wish they'd keep pushing. Uh, uh, famously, I think uh, um, NBC's. Uh, now, Meet the Press uh, host Chuck Todd did focus uh, at one point for about five minutes or so it seemed uh, with a question just kept asking it in different ways but couldn't get the answer. And so uh, 
we're, we're awfully big on what and not, not so big on how. And I think, and this is a whole other topic, and then I'll be quiet, uh, to quote Pogo, you know, we've met the enemy, he's us. I think we are responsible for the candidates we have. We can, we can demean them all we want, but in the end, we're getting what we deserve because we're not really challenging them. We're not asking hard questions, and we're, we're holding the bar far too low. And you know that. You really do know that. We deserve better than this. And if I say there's a liar running for president, each of you, no matter how you feel about your candidate, will be correct about the opponent. We deserve better than that. I think I'll pick up a little bit on the last point. You know, there's a lot of evidence that we do want the horse race. Uh, a study out of Stanford in the 2000 election cycle randomly sent CDs to thousands of homes across the country. And they said, if you put this in your computer, it will tell us um, what it is on the CD that you read. And on the CD is information about George W. Bush and Al Gore, their biographies, their issue positions, and uh, the most recent stories about how they're doing in the polls. And guess which thing people read? how they were doing in the polls, and they didn't read the stories about their issue preferences or their biographies or other things that might fit how they would govern, you know, if they were president. And now other kind of people are following up along that study and asking, you know, for, hey, can, will you let us hook into your web browser and see what kind of, where you're going to look for political information in this election cycle and kind of trying to replicate that evidence. And so far, the early returns are, once again, we're looking to the horse race. But, but I want to push you a little bit on, um, I don't know that the media need to give us the horse race. It's very easy to look and find the results of public opinion polls without reading it in the newspaper or seeing it on the evening news. It's, I can type in real clear politics and immediately find out every poll that's come out in the last 10 years about who's running for what office and what competitors. I don't need the news media to tell me who's ahead. That's incredibly easy to find. What I need the news media to do is tell me how these people are different. What are they telling me about what is and isn't true? And uh, what, are these, what are their candidates' records with promises they made and promises they've tried to keep to see if they actually care about the things they say they want to do? And then how about the promises they've kept, which speaks to their legislative skill, given the circumstance they might find themselves in and they govern at different levels of office. And so the question was about fairness. Uh, I think that's a really hard question to answer. And I think, you know, however many people there are in this room, there are probably that many different definitions of fairness. We could think about it in terms of, you know, covering them in the same amount of volume, um, in terms of the, the amount of attention people get. We could think about covering issues that favor each party in equal measure, so that the public tends to evaluate Democrats more favorably on education and Republicans more favorably on crime. So if there are more crime stories, we could say that's biased in favor of Republicans, or more education stories biased in favor of Democrats. But we can't pick the issues in presidential elections, and candidates are gonna talk about what they think is gonna help them win and journalists ought to report those things. And so I think it's difficult to think about fairness, but I agree with nearly everything you would said earlier about an abdication of responsibility and calling out claims that candidates make, especially Donald Trump, but, but others too, that just aren't true. Um, Trump would say things in the debate the other night where uh, you know, Secretary Clinton said, well, you said you know, climate change is a, a hoax from the Chinese, and he said, well, I never said that. And, it was still on his Twitter account. They, they, the Trump campaign started to delete some of the tweets during the debate about things he had, was claiming that he had never said, but in fact had, had said. And so I, I do think that in terms of reporting what's true and how we know it's true, this has been a pretty major failing um, broadly. But it's also a heyday of fact-checking. PolitiFact, factcheck.org, The Washington Post, Lynn Kessler, um, all are folks who do fact-checking on these candidates and at least lay out for you, here's a claim that was made and here's how we came to the conclusion we came to. And so you, at least you could read it and disagree with the conclusion and know how they got there, which is a lot better than we've had in, in other elections. This is one of those questions, don't get me started. <laughs> now, now, I know you're gonna ask me questions about things that I've said about the conservative media, um, and because I have been uh, critical, and my, my, my wife keeps saying, yes, but you, you have to have the whole quote in, in that, and, and she's right about this. The, the, the question of, of media bias is something that I have talked about for 20 years. Okay, in terms of, is, is the mainstream media, is it biased or fair? How many here think that the mainstream media is biased? How many of you think that it's fair? Okay, you see? 
This is something that the mainstream media has been in deep denial about because um, people have noticed the bias for years. One of the things that, that has always amazed me has been the, the way that mainstream media elites have been um, just refused to acknowledge the fact that, okay, you have an agenda, your readers are smart, they, they recognize what's going on here. And this has been, uh, you know, played out over the last 20 years. And, and what Donald Trump is doing right now, I mean, he is really um, reaping the whirlwind in a sense, or I mean, when the chickens have come home to roost, whatever cliche you, you, you want here, that there has been this growing disillusionment with the media. Uh, virtually every public opinion poll will, will show in fact, there was a Gallup poll showing that uh, uh, trust in the mainstream media is at an all-time low right now. Now, this is something that, in retrospect, I wish the, the media would have recognized that their number one product that they're selling is their credibility. Once you lose your credibility, then all sorts of things are going to happen. Look, I would not have be a conservative talk show host. There would not be a conservative media. There would not be this alternative media had the mainstream media been able to continue to maintain its credibility. Um, the fact-checking world is, is probably more important this year than ever before. And I think that some of the fact-checkers do an outstanding job. Glenn Kessler, you mentioned, uh, factcheck.org does a fantastic job. Uh, PolitiFact has been a complete joke. And um, there is not a single conservative in the state of Wisconsin who will say that they believe that the mainstream media has been fair to, to conservatives. And I will just tell you, an anecdote. Again, I've been in the media here for, for many, many years. And um, earlier this year, when the national politics uh, exploded on, on the scene, um, I was interviewed by a number of publications in, in, in a row. Uh, Politi Politi Politico, um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to remember when this really hit me. It was a, a Canadian newspaper, it was somebody from the New York Times, Politico, maybe one other newspaper. And the, the, the stories came out, and it was remarkable to me that they quoted me accurately, and they actually did interviews that wanted to find out what I thought and why I had done this. Now, the reason it struck me was I had been doing this for 20 years, and, and this had never happened to me before, because being a conservative talk show host in the state of Wisconsin, you just don't get that. So you experience this kind of bias. So. You know, I have been quoted as saying critical things of the conservative media, but understand that this environment really is also a product of the arrogance and the, the, the continued sense that we know what's better. Just another analogy that I would use is if you were putting out, you got a restaurant and half of your customers, you know, came in every week and said, we don't like what you are serving. You know, any restaurant owner at some point would go, okay, you know, we actually need to serve the customers as long as we're doing the good thing. And yet, you know, in my area, you had conservatives around the country have been saying for decades now to the media, you are biased, you are not fair, you are treating us with contempt and disdain. So when Donald Trump goes out and he says uh, the media is, uh, you know, is disgusting, crooked, dishonest, and corrupt, trust me, those are the biggest applause lines he gets at every one of his rallies. But this is not something he created. He is exploiting this, uh, this, uh, this situation. Henry? Sure, absolutely. I'm going to follow up Charlie. Uh, and I agree with you. In the, in the 70s, we all uh, watched Uncle Walter, and he gave us the truth with a capital T, and that was the agenda. Now we don't trust anybody. So what has changed in the past 40 years, aside from the fact that we now have advocacy media, we say media as if it's one animal. There is advocacy media with Sean Hannity and Rachel Maddow and Rush Limbaugh and Charlie Sykes. And then there is the newspaper person who tells only the truth. <laughs> um, but, but obviously that's a change in the 70s. And also, of course, we have social media, which has enabled us to get in our silos and listen to people who say what we want to hear and not be open to other ideas because we know the truth and nobody else does and disagrees with us. But I'm going to ask you, Charlie, what has changed since the 70s to make us distrustful of media? Well, you're going to get into the other part of the, uh, you're probably going to anticipate your, your, your question. Because you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And um, th this has been one of the really disorienting things about this year. And, and I'm, I'm going to be really honest about it, that, that we're going to have to figure out what has actually happened. 
Because I do think, and because I was part of this, let's create the other alternative media to fill in this gap. And I thought this was a wonderful idea. I have been part of it. It's been a great career. Um, and, and, and it was necessary to do, to have conservative radio, um, to, to have conservative websites, to have uh, you know, conservative cable stations. And my, you know, what I thought up until very, very recently was that this was balancing the mainstream media and that it was actually creating a more informed electorate who were then able to become more engaged. And you used one of the key words, though. What's happened, though, I think at a certain point, is that we have created these alternative reality silos and that we live in different worlds, the right and, and the left. There's a difference between advocacy journalism and propaganda journalism. One of the things that has happened, I think, unfortunately, is the folks on my side have also squandered their main uh, resource, which is their credibility. And so, you know, as, as I watched, you know, what's happened this, this year with, with a lot of the conservative media, um, you know, some of the gatekeepers who I actually thought, I, you know, I've spent 20 years arguing that we don't do this for ratings, that we actually believe this stuff. And then to watch, you know, fanboys like Sean Hannity sell out everything they claim to believe in has been really disillusioning, I have to say. The other thing, which, which um, my, my wife is upset that I don't tell the whole story, I, I, I did realize earlier this year that when, in fact, you began talking about, you know, I began talking about, okay, well, this is not true, this is not true, you know, what, what Donald Trump just said is, 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 is false. Uh, people would say, well, no, I, I read this on my Facebook feed, or, you know, I read, I read this on the Drudge Report or on Breitbart. And I said, well, this is not true. I mean, look, you know, here's a fact check in the Washington Post or the New York Times. And they would say, well, those rags, those liberal rags. And you step back and you realize, okay, so we have dropped all of the standards, all of the guideposts for what is true. So we actually now have entered into a, what I described as a post-truth environment, where there is nothing that's falsifiable. And by the way, this is true on the left as well. Um, I, I, I'm in this very strange situation now where, because I am a contributor for MSNBC. So during the morning, I do a conservative talk show, and then at night, I'm on MSNBC. So I kind of feel like the, the circus character has got you know, one foot on each of the horses and they're going in different directions. But what's really striking is these are alternative realities. That if you are a liberal, you can live in an alternative reality silo where you have your own facts, you have your own issues, you have your own beliefs. And there is no, and there really is no um, crossover to what somebody on the other side. And, and we have, unfortunately, we have sites that actually I had once thought were, were credible, that, you know, frankly, just traffic in the worst kind of misinformation, and it's hard to catch up with it. I mean, you know, what, what is the standard? Um, how do I say, this is what is true, this is not what's false? Let, let's at least debate what we know. And this has become increasingly difficult. I and mean, I would suggest to you know, Americans that if you get most of your news and your opinions from your Facebook feed, you need to examine your life choices. You know, that there, there are things out there. Um, but it is, it, it is this alternative reality. So yes, the question of what's changed, we don't have the mandarins sitting in New York deciding, you know, the, you know, NBC, ABC decide what is truth, and you know, we, it trickles down to us. It's great. It's wonderful now that we've democratized the media. The problem is there are no standards. There are no standards, and, um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I think that this is um, playing out. I think we're seeing it. I don't know how to put it back together again. I really don't know. And, um, you know, as critical as of the liberal media as I have been, What's happened on the conservative media has been just as alarming this year. And unfortunately, Donald Trump is exploiting that to the maximum. I wanted to add something that I think will be much less popular to say, but that's, that's okay. Um, I think part of the question here relates to how do we decide what's biased? And it's very difficult to figure out where the chicken or the egg is. It was it the case that the media were so left-leaning or liberal for so long that then there had to be some kind of response, and that response was meant to balance out and offer alternatives, or is it the case that when we interpret information as humans, we tend to remember the stuff that's bad about our side and forget the stuff that's good about our side? And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that's how humans process information. And there's, um, one of my favorite studies has a, 
a scholar who took a, a CNN script from, that aired on CNN and one that aired on Fox, had a local news reporter from another market read it in front of a green screen, and then show it to people with either the CNN background or the Fox background. When Fox News viewers saw the Fox background, even if it was the CNN words, they thought it was fine. When CNN viewers saw it with the CNN background, they thought it was fine. When they saw the same words with the Fox background, those CNN viewers thought, this is the biggest amount of conservative bias I've ever seen. And, and conservatives would see the Fox words on CNN, look at this liberal bias. And so we're not great judges of bias. People raised their hand and said they thought the media were biased, that it's, and that they may be right. But it's also the case that when we're all watching the Packers, we think that that was past interference on Randall, on Randall Cobb. And maybe the Vikings fans don't think that it was past interference on Randall Cobb. And maybe somebody could care, care less about who wins that game is a better judge of whether it was past interference on Randall Cobb. And so when we care about something, we're way more likely to see bias within it. That doesn't excuse bias coverage, but it doesn't excuse us from how we interpret information. Yeah, the problem is that there are no referees anymore. And if there are no referees and no agreed upon rules, and, and, and some of the players think that the field is 150 yards long, and some of them think that it's you know 80 yards long, so that's part of the problem. And then they deny that they ever said that it was 80 yards longer. Right, yards longer. so this is, I mean, that, that, that is part of the problem, that at least there used to be some sort of a, you know, and I don't want to use the word gatekeeper, but you know, just some sort of a, of a guidepost, which I don't think that we have anymore. I think that's right. But you said, Charlie, that democratization of media is a good thing. Do we really need a referee? Isn't the problem that we aren't discriminating? We as the American people are just so close-minded in our beliefs and so insistent that our candidate, no matter what he or she says or does, is the best candidate. Isn't the, the, the fault really with us? I mean, I don't think any referee can ever come by and tell us what the truth is. But I think in the end, we have to take the responsibility to say, I'm gonna be discriminating, I'm gonna be open-minded, I'm gonna to listen to what you have to say, even though you support somebody differently than me. And that's not the way we act anymore. That's not the way we do things. We just like to be patted on the back and told, right on, brother, keep the faith. Just, yeah. just, oh, go ahead, sorry. The, the confirmation bias is, is incredibly strong. There's, there's, there's no question about it. And that people really you know, do not want to hear the other thing. I mean, I, you know, in, 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 the, in the morning, I know that I will get a hundred emails saying, you know, don't tell me something negative about Trump. And when I go on Lawrence O'Donnell, they don't want to hear anything negative about Hillary Clinton. So yeah, but part of the problem is there's just this flood of information. You know, you know, people are getting this information. If you're on social media, you're, you're, you're getting stories, you're getting data, you're getting, and, and I will tell you, I do this for a living, and it is really hard to know what is credible, what is reliable, what is believable. <laughs> Um, and I spent a lot of my time basically saying, okay, you know, what is the source of this? Is this, is this, is this real? And I wanted people to go to somebody and say, okay, can you tell me, even though this may confirm my bias, is this real or not? But your larger point is crucial. You and I met, just did a very brief conversation before we came up here. The reality is, is that ultimately we do get the politics we deserve. You know, and, and, and everything that's happening now is a symptom, it's not the cause. And, and, and there is a fundamental, you know, what this says about the American culture is, is, is actually more troubling than what the candidates. I mean, the candidate, I, you know, I, I've said this before, it, there's, there's, it's bad when you have a politician who lies, but that's not new. What is new is an American culture that says, yes, that candidate is lying, and I'm okay with that. That's, that's the far more troubling development. I was hoping you would have a conversation amongst the panelists, and that worked out pretty well. Um, let me ask one final question before we open up to the audience, like real quick. And uh, if you have a question, you can already line up behind that microphone, so we can we don't have a long uh, break in between. But let me ask about social media in particular. Looking at the campaign from the candidates' kind of perspective, uh, if we're looking at Donald Trump again uh, as an as an example, he is using Twitter differently from any other candidate in, 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 a, in a way that he often retweets posts from ordinary citizens. He personally posts a lot more than, for example, Hillary Clinton does. And uh, he also frequently um, retweets news media articles. Uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign is much more, you might call it, conservative in that sense because uh, she's often retweeting her own campaign messages. So, uh, and, and so my one, I'm wondering sort of how do you think is the direct communication between candidates and citizens changing um, campaigns and, and what direction do you think 
this threat communication is headed? Well, this is a great test. This election is a great test for that issue. For decades, if not more, we have believed, in those of us who study elections have believed that knocking on doors, calling people, talking to them directly, tends to be the most effective way to persuade someone to vote or, or, pers or to remind them that they want to show up and vote on election day. And Donald Trump does not have that kind of turnout operation in the way that political parties and presidential candidates always have. And Hillary Clinton does have that kind of operation. And so the question is, are, are these people who are happy to tell a pollster on the phone that they're gonna vote for Donald Trump are gonna show up and vote on election day when they're not reminded with three or four calls and someone knocking on their door in the way that presidential candidates have for years. We've, we've thought that face-to-face -face deliberation and that kind of personal touch matters to people who are likely voters. And Donald Trump's campaign strategy is, 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 is largely to you know, play the media, in, in, whether it's through his Twitter account, whether it's saying outrageous things to divert attention from the negative reaction to the previous outrageous thing, or then to have good news. So, you know, after he lost an early primary race the next day, he had Chris Christie's endorsement. He's very good at redirecting attention when he needs to. And so, he, but he's not doing the traditional things that candidates do. Here are lots of television ads in uh, competitive states. Um, knock on doors, call people, to have, have volunteers do that sort of work. And so, we're really getting an opportunity to test the, the, the thesis to campaigns matter. For years, I would stand in front of students and say, well, we don't really know because there's never a case where a candidate just won't air ads, or there isn't a case where a candidate won't try to turn out the vote. And in this case, the Republican Party is working very hard to keep the Senate and to maintain a, a strong advantage in the House and help their down-ballot races. But they're not getting the help from the top of the ticket that they normally get. And so this is a real test of all that, I think. Yeah, I mean, what? I understand that the party is still doing a lot of those things. And, and what, what, what Trump has done is he's basically outsourced the campaign. Um, you know, he, he's, a lot of his business model is basically you have somebody build something, you slap your name on it and everything. Well, he's basically doing that with his campaign. So they will be doing that. Um, it, is, it is remarkable the way that social media has changed everything. And this is part of this unfiltered. And I love Twitter. I, I really do. I mean, I, I, I spend a lot of time on Twitter. Um, and it's a, way of, it's a way of keeping up with lots of different opinions. It's a way of keeping in touch with the way people react, um, and, it's, and it's very valuable. But there's a dark side to it as well. I mean, it's just like the argument is fire good or fire bad. Well, it, it depends how much you know where it is. Um, one of the things that, uh, again, this year that, that I have noticed is that uh, so social media empowers people who, who were once in the shadows and probably should have stayed there. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and it's a fascinating question that I would love to discuss with somebody. Is, does social media actually make people uglier and meaner? Or does it just expose something that's already there? I mean, there are moments where you realize there are people out there that you did not imagine. And, and, and the, 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 the bullying, the trolling, and the, the hate that can sometimes be on, on social media, it really has changed American politics. Um, I got a little bit of a flavor of, of this. I was on, uh, uh, when, 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 back, remember when Donald Trump and Megyn Kelly were having this feud? And uh, I don't know if you know how Twitter works, but I was on her show once. <coughs> so she, you tweet something out with her handle on it and then my handle. So I, I, get, I get to see everything that was written back to her. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, I have no idea. I mean, th th there are people out there, thousands of people who would write the most vile, awful, things. Um, and this is something that people have to decide, how do you handle this? Uh, you know, uh, what will this do to American political discourse? And because there, there, there's something deeply disturbing out there. Now, on the other hand, democratization is good. That, that every person can be their own publisher. And, 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 and with an educated, responsible, decent populace, this is a great thing. But we are not the Athenian democracy right now. Um, and, and this is something that we're going to have to uh, cope with going forward. And, and by the way, one of the mo most disturbing things about what uh, Donald Trump has done is when he does retweet, that some of the stuff that he retweets and some of the people he has empowered is, is I mean, look, I'm, I'm a conservative. I am a, I'm a right winger. I had no idea that there were the, as many of the alt-right folks. And when you have a presidential candidate who has hundreds of thousands of followers and he will retweet white supremacist, um, you know, fake material. 
There was once a time when that would have been disqualifying, but trust me, these people are being empowered by this, and, and that, that will have long-term consequences. Uh, I'm just a country bumpkin publisher, and I do not use Twitter. And uh, number one, I'm overwhelmed by the number of platforms I require to use for my job, but two, I don't think you can say anything too intelligent in 150 characters, and I'm not going to do that. And I think we already have a campaign that's sufficiently shallow in issue positions that we need not encourage that kind of behavior. Uh, our little paper read, ran an editorial recently on Syria, uh, thanks to the Center for Politics and the People, and a speaker that we had come. And I, I defy you to find either one of the can major candidates uh, any one of the four candidates' websites and see what their discussion is on Syria, which is a very critical issue. By the way, we're discussing today Miss Universe and her weight. And meanwhile, the past eight days, a thousand people have died in Aleppo. And today they bombed two hospitals and a bread line. And we're discussing Miss Universe. It's shallow, it's cheap, it's tawdry, it's beneath the American people, and that's what we're getting. And I don't like it. However, however, thank you, David. Thank you, Mom. No. <laughs> However, I, I do appreciate the fact that it has enabled Donald Trump to speak directly to the American people. On the other hand, you have Hillary Clinton, who is as controlled and as careful and as antiseptic and as, I mean, literally people holding a rope to keep her away from the press while she's parading down uh, from a Memorial Day parade. Uh, we deserve better access than that. And I think through his tweets, for better or worse, Donald Trump has given us some, some window into the man, and I, and I appreciate that compared to his, uh, his uh, opponent. Okay, thank you, um, all of you. Let's uh, begin taking questions uh, from the audience. We have a microphone here. Um, the only request that I have is that uh, please, when you ask a question, uh, please state your name and possibly your affiliation if you have one. And the second request would be to keep your question fairly brief if possible. Since nobody else is up here, I'll go. Uh, I'm Edwin, <clears throat> I'm Edwin Bach, I'm the Dean of Faculty here. I'm also a professor of politics and government with Henrik. Uh, one of the premises of the critique of the media here seems to be that we used to be better, right? The media used to be a gatekeeper, or it used to give the truth to people, it used to not be partisan, and that helped us to pick the best candidates. It seems to me that's an historical anomaly, right? That for most of our history, except maybe post-World War II when media became professionalized like some of the other things, the job of the media was to incite the people and you know, say terrible things about the other team. You knew who your newspaper was, and you read your newspaper and hated the other guys. You know, it was democratized for a long time, and people were sort of returning to that. So I guess my question is, is this, was this a little brief moment that we imagined the media was something different, and now we're returning to what it's always been in a democracy? And can we survive that? Can we have a thriving politics like we had for 150 years with a media that looks like what our media is becoming? I think there's a lot of things that were a part of that blip. So we first really started measuring public opinion with precision you know, around the time that the mainstream television media really took off. And it was an atypically moderate time in terms of the way our lawmakers voted and roll call voting in Congress. And when you have three networks and at 5.30, if you want the TV on, the news is on all three channels, there's a real incentive not to get things wrong lest their credibility be immediately destroyed. And so in that environment, you expect a different kind of news media than in one where there's an unlimited number of channels and an internet and 24 hours you know, you know, news of wherever you want it. But at the same time, polarization has, has been the general state of American politics. You know, we start with a revolution, we had a civil war, I mean, that's about as polarized as you can be, is literally trying to kill half of the other people in your country. And we've, polarization has been the general state, but when we started measuring public opinion fairly accurately in the 1950s, it was a moderate time. And so we thought, oh, well, this must, must have been how it always was. But in fact, it is not how it's always been. And so we have been fairly divided. There are some democratizing aspects of the new media landscape that I think are really positive. Um, the Marquette Law Poll, uh, we asked, uh, at Wisconsin, we asked uh, Charles Franklin, who runs that, to ask a question 
during the, the recall uh, time of, of Governor Walker, if anyone had stopped talking to a friend of theirs because of their opinion about the recall, because we really had sensed that politics was infecting daily life in a way that it maybe hadn't before. We found that fully a third of Wisconsinites said, yeah, I've stopped talking to somebody. A predictor of people who said, no, I haven't, was heavy social media use. So there's something good about hearing the other side out there on Twitter or Facebook. There's also a deep, dark, ugly side, and those usually aren't the same kinds of people using it. And so I think there are, there are pluses and minuses to every new tool that we have, but I would say the general state of our system has been divided. The government subsidized the partisan press in the early days uh, of our country, and um, that's, you know, giving them free airwaves now in, in some ways is not terribly different. Actually, your question is very, very interesting because I, I used to make this argument years ago that, that, that in fact, look, um, there's nothing wrong with having you know, partisan media because you, you, you would have the kind of debate and dialogue that you would have. However, you were talking about newspapers. Um, now we live in the age of the electronic media, and, and there, was, there once was a brief time, maybe, maybe it's going to be just a window in American history, where we actually kind of had a, a shared dialogue and a shared culture. You know, um, and, and now we have it maybe a one day a year where we all watch the Super Bowl. But um, there was at least some sort of general political culture where you know people would you know e even during these divided periods of time you know, people would fill halls like this and they would hear Lincoln and Douglas debate they would have intelligent debate people would come and they would know about you know the what, what the other side would think also um, in, in just in terms of the way we've sorted ourselves out it used to be that people of different political uh, philosophies different classes lived in the same place. You know, in a place like Ripon, you would have, you know, the doctor would live next to the person who might, uh, you know, be the, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the farmer. Um, we've sorted ourselves out physically, geographically, you know, and we see this in southeastern Wisconsin very radically. And so now also with the electronic media, now we are creating these alternative realities. So maybe this was that period you're describing of, of the media being, you know, the shared culture, maybe that was the, the anomaly. But then again, so is the whole modern world. You could describe, I mean, every, everything that we are experiencing, you know, is, is an anomaly in, in, a, in a sense. And it, but the thing is, it's accelerating with incredible speed. I do think that things that used to take 500 years then began to take 100 years, and then the change would take 50 years, and then 20 years, and now maybe we're at a period where we are having technological and social changes at an incredible rate. So who knows where this is going? And, and if, in fact, we continue to fragment like this, are we actually ever going to be able to sit down in a room like this and have conversations? Or is this, or is this an, an anomaly? Our newspaper is called the Ripon Commonwealth Press, and that middle name, Commonwealth, is a notion talking about, Charlie, or that you're longing for, the, the day when we all had a, a common interest and we were more democratized and where we lived and, and where we worshipped and, and we hung out with. And uh, our newspaper has won many awards because we've entered a lot, but um, <laughs> like other weekly newspapers in the state, our circulation is dropping and I don't think it's because we aren't putting money into it or getting the advertising support, I think it's because we like to, um, as I say to my wife Mary, um, we like to look at our Facebook, our electronic show and tell, I call it. We, I, you know, I, I think Donald Trump is a narcissist. And if you don't know about the culture of narcissism, read Christopher Lash's book from the early 80s. He's a narcissist. But I think we are narcissists. We are so wrapped up in our Facebook and in telling what we ate for supper and showing a picture of it, <laughs> who cares? <laughs> and consequently, I think we are less interested in the community. It is harder to fill Dickens of a Christmas a community that Nancy's chair. It's hard to get people for that anymore. Our community festival, Ripon Fest, it no longer exists because they couldn't find people to volunteer for it. We are bowling alone, to use the name of that book that was popular in the 90s. We are so caught up in ourselves, we are narcissists. And so we have reaped what we've sown and his name was Donald Trump, and you can argue her name is Hillary Clinton. We do have uh, time for more questions. Uh, Go ahead. Thank you, 
Hi, my name is uh, my name is Aaron Becker. I'm a member of the Madness Hell Party. <laughs> Earlier this year, there was a debate on uh, CNBC that where the Republicans uh, were very uh, very unhappy with the moderators. Uh, then just a few weeks ago, we had a forum um, where Matt Lauer took quite a bit of heat from the left for his handling of Hillary Clinton. Just last night, or two nights ago, now Donald Trump is all upset about Lester Holt and, and questions that, that were or weren't asked. So the question I would like to pose to you, the panel, is just what are your thoughts of the, of the moderators and how they've handled the debates and how the networks have handled uh, the debates and the fairness of the questions and the handling thereof? I want to know what the mad as hell party is. <laughs> <laughs> to quote Charlie Sykes, um, if you want to know who lost the debate, see who's complaining at the end of it. Yeah, right, right. See who's bitching about the moderator or the questions that they could have asked themselves because they're in the debate. So I, I, I think it's nonsense, frankly, because whatever questions that the moderator asks, and you know they do it, the candidates can give any answer they want. They can challenge their opponent as much as they want. The moderator is just there to get the discussion going. Sorry, Henry. They really don't mean that much. <laughs> I think it's the most thankless job in the universe because, you know, first of all, um, you, you, imagine being the moderator, and your, your number one concern is not, you know, the truth of what's good for the country. You, you, you just want to survive with your reputation intact. And by the way, I, I, I was impressed with Lester Holt the other night, um, who in the first, what, 45 minutes just shut up. I mean, he let them debate, and I thought that was kind of interesting that he did that. And, and then he did push back, and, and I think you could make a, you know, a criticism that he was that he could have pushed Hillary Clinton a little bit harder. I mean, it's, it's always easy to, to second guess these things. How amazing that they didn't talk about immigration. They 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 didn't talk about Obamacare. They didn't talk about health care. Um, Benghazi hardly got mentioned at all. Now, is that Don, is that uh, uh, Holt's problem? Um, or was that uh, you know, the fault of the candidates? Um, in, in terms of, as I said, it's a, it's a thankless job. Now, the fact that everyone you mentioned there is, is NBC, and the name of the period name is NBC, so take that for what it's worth. But um, <laughs> um, I, I remember watching um, the CNBC debate, which was the one that got the pan the most. And that was the one where John Harwood um, basically asked Donald Trump, well, are you a real candidate or a cartoon version of the candidate? And then all hell broke loose and everything. Um, that, that was probably the one where I, I think the, the, the moderator was a little bit too, too hot. On the other hand, that of course would be the question that I wanted to ask. <laughs> I, mean, I was sitting there going, okay, um, you know, yeah, he actually asked what I'm thinking. Uh, but uh, I, again, I, this is the thing, is that the person who did the bad, the worst in um, the debate always wants to have a scapegoat. He's never gonna say, I, you know, I lost the debate because uh, I was terrible. They blame him on it. I think David, you had a question. Yeah, I'm David Sackerson. I'm on the uh, business faculty here and I also spent the first eight years of my career as a newspaper journalist. Uh, I got out of it for the reasons that Tim was suggesting. It was tawdry, it was, if it leads, it bleeds, or if it bleeds, it leads, it was, it, was a, it was a prostitute. And I'm wondering if you think there's any way for us to turn that around, to, to get broadcast media back to something intelligent or even reasonably intelligent. And second, you talked about, uh, Charlie, you talked particularly about the fact checkers. And I I'm, I'm really appreciate the, the fact checking that's gone on. But none of it seems to be coming from the mainstream media. It's all coming from, from outside of the mainstream media. Can we change that somehow? Um, well, I don't want to defend the mainstream media, but there is, there is some good stuff. That Annenberg Center of FactCheck.org is really, really good work. Um, I do think Glenn Kessler of the Washington Post does, does, does very good work. Um, actually, the New York Times does some pretty good work. Uh, I, I'm, deeply frustrated about what PolitiFact has done because I think that they, by nitpicking and cherry picking and turning it into opinion, they have discredited the whole fact checking world to a lot of readers, which, which really was a disservice. I mean, it's very, very valuable. Uh, so I, I don't know. And in terms of, of talking, I mean, I, I, you know, I, 
there, there's certainly, particularly when you watch tele local television news, if it leads, it leads. It, 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 is, it is almost a cartoon version of, of, of itself. There are actually serious journalists out there. And I have to say that my appreciation for my journalistic training, um, I, I appreciate it more because, you know, the questions I'm asking in terms of fact-checking are, you know, what is true? How do we know this? What are the sources? That, that is really the heart of, of good journalism. And I'm really hoping that after this fiasco of an election, however it turns out, there's going to be certain introspection on the part of the media, asking exactly the question, how did we lose our credibility? Why did this, did this happen? You know, what, what does it say about our ethics, our values, our effectiveness, and our relationship? What is it that we missed? Because if you're a journalist, you don't want to miss a big story. And I think, I will tell you the number of journalists who kind of look at, you know, these, so we obviously have missed what's going on in the country. There's something out here that we had no idea was happening, um, and that really challenges them at their core. So if, if, if this does lead to a certain amount of introspection and asking questions, um, that would be highly unusual, um, because it hasn't happened so far, so maybe I'm naive. But I do think that this whole process, what do you think, gentlemen, think? I, you know, it's been kind of a, it's got to be kind of a shock. Um, to uh, to the media to be start asking some of these questions. I, I think so. And there's there's a big debate in the journalism community about the value of fact checking. So journalists would traditionally think about fact checking as did I spell Sykes with a Y or with an I, right? And and they get that fact right. And and then if, if if I said you know the Earth is flat and you say the Earth is round, they report both of those statements and allow the reader to make her or his own. And, and fact checkers want to check both of those statements and say, well, here's how we know the, the Earth is not flat, and here's the evidence from you know what we've seen from outer space and orbiting around the sun, and you know showing you that information. And that's a that's a relatively new movement in journalism. And you know, I think it's I think you're right to say that you know the, the organization that you know rates things pants on fire is the most popular one, but it's the one that maybe does the, the less of a thorough job as compared to the Annenberg uh, site as, and, and, and Kessler at, at the Washington Post. But I do think that um, journalists are starting to really wrestle with this who, who aren't traditional fact checkers. And they're starting to think about challenging claims that, that political elites make in ways that they hadn't done as much of in the recent past. And so I, I think that's probably good for journalism. Will there be a lot of hand-wringing and navel-gazing for a couple of days? And then I think probably back to business as usual. I don't know. I'm, I'm, well, first of all, David, four Pinocchios for you because I wasn't calling the media tawdry. I have a, my editor here, who's the reason we, we won, and, and my a reporter, and they're the reason that we won awards. So they're not, you're, not, you're not tawdry, guys. <laughs> I'm a little nervous about the notion, though, of the mainstream media suddenly fact checking in their stories. We do not do that because we don't want to put spin on it. And because we don't want to be Candy Crowley and chicken, you know, and pull, pull what we want to fact check and maybe ignore others. That's not our job. Our job is to chronicle what is said and what is done and let you, the reader, decide. Now, there is a place for fact checking, and I agree with Charlie. Politic fact, I, I, I look at it, and sometimes they're doing gymnastics to try to get to a half truth when you know it's false. They're, they're, they're saying, well, what he said was wrong, but his intention was right, so half true. No, it, it, it's wrong, it's false. And I can't speak for the others because I don't see them. I see PolitiFact. The intention is good. And it, and it is in the mainstream medium. That's where these appear. But it's not the, the beat reporter's job to fact check. And by the way, it is your responsibility as informed Americans who have Google to fact check on your own. You can find out what's right and wrong, unless you're saying intuitively, that squares with my reality, so I'm not going to bother with finding out whether it's true. And then it's your problem, and you're going to get what you deserve. I'm okay with one, one last question, if anybody would like to. Please, Gary. I'm Gary Wetzel, and I, I'm an ordinary person. I always ask questions. <laughs> I just had two things. How many of us really want to know the truth about our children? I mean, hasn't this always been the case that we, we see our children differently than the rest of the world does? And the second thing is, 
there in fact is a referee in U.S. culture. It's the same one that's been there since well before I was born, and that is, does it make money? To show my conservative stripe to the answer, my answer to the first question is no, we really don't care about our children. Our culture is debased. Our economy, our, our, our financial debt of 19 plus trillion dollars shows we don't give a damn about our kids and our grandkids. We're spending their future. And, and, and to have our Republican standard bearer suggest another entitlement if we can't pay, if we can't sustain the ones we have is grotesque. And to have people support that because he is who he is shows that, I, I don't know where their principles are, but they've given them up because uh, he, he's as much a big spender as anybody on the left. But no, I don't think we care much about children. It's all about us and all about what we're going to eat for supper and putting it on our Facebook page. And your second question, yeah, I guess you're right. You know, capitalism, um, what makes money is the ethic. And that's not all bad. That's actually pretty good. I like free enterprise given the alternative. I was not a Bernie supporter. Sorry. <laughs> don't have enough time to go through that, the, the, the referee being money, as you know, on, on the one hand, I'm an advocate of free markets and, and the efficiency of free markets. On, on the other hand, you know, truth is not decided by a majority vote. And um, the thing that makes the most money is not always the best product. And, and, I, and I, uh, I, I, I think that one of the things since we've been talking about the media is how much of what we are talking about is driven by the power of, of just the bottom line. The, 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 the tyranny of ratings for you know, the cable networks, for radio shows. I mean, anyone that tells you that this does not drive a lot of what you see and what you read is just is clueless, because it, 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 it definitely does. So, um, so Sean, Sean Hannity makes $29 million a year. He makes a hell of a lot more than, than me. Does that mean that he is more reliable? Well, some people may think so. Um, but I'm just not sure that that dollar number is necessarily the ultimate referee. We live in this celebrity culture where we actually have people who are wildly successful for no discernible reason um, and famous for being, being famous. So, I, I, again, yes, I do favor the free market, and it is often a good referee of good ideas, but it is not infallible. I always, I do always like that the, the, the quote when people tell me, "Well, so and so is, you know, the majority thinks this, or this makes more money." Well, you know, one plus God makes a majority, and I think we kind of need to remember that. Yeah, it just makes me think of, you know, I think it was Churchill who said, you know, "Democracy is the worst form of government, except for all of the other ones." <laughs> and, and you know, I think. I think we do love our children, and I, but I also agree with this idea that we maybe don't want to always hear negative things, and whether our children are actual kids or whether they are our ideas, the ones that we hold, our values that we hold most closely. And you know, it turns out in a lot, you know, we've I think maybe all in one way or another talked about the importance of an informed citizenry tonight. Uh, but it's also the case that people who are the most likely to fight back when they're told that they're wrong uh, are the educated because we've taught them how to argue and marshal evidence. And so it's, it's the most educated conservatives who are on average more likely to believe that President Obama wasn't born in the US. It's the most educated liberals who on average are more likely to think vaccines cause autism because they know how to argue back and they can fight back and, and they're, they do that. And so and the, there's even downsides to being able to have some good reasoning skills and some good skills dealing with evidence. And uh, it's very, very, very hard, I think, to check our ideas and our values at the door when we're consuming in, in, in information or reading things on Facebook or on Twitter or watching it on television or listening to it uh, on the radio. It's really challenging to do. And I have, I have a less pessimistic view of, of the public. I, I would agree that we get the politics we deserve, and I would say that the people and the will of their votes tend to be the ultimate referee. Uh, but we're all busy. And we all have kids and grandkids and uncles and cousins and sisters and people who are sick and jobs and maybe we're trying to find another job and it's pretty hard to then also verify what I just saw on the news to see if what the news told me was true. Uh, I should be able to trust that what the news tells me is verifiably true um, and if I learn that I can't I should move on to a, another source and I should probably try to use more than one source before I really make an opinion about something 
But that's, that's a lot of, that's, that's hard, which isn't to say we shouldn't do it. Most things that are worth doing are hard, but I don't think that it's as simple as we're failing ourselves. Well, I want to uh, thank you for your questions, and I want to thank you again uh, for coming tonight. Let's give it up one more time for our excellent panelists. that the center is, uh, is putting together. This coming Monday, uh, we will have a discussion with uh, State Representative uh, John Balwick, uh, who will um, especially focus on higher education. Uh, this will be at 6.30 in the evening in Little Theater, East Hall 101. And then next Wednesday, we will have Congressman Glenn Grothman coming, and uh, he will also be um, here at 6.30, also in Little Theater, in East 101. Thank you again, everybody. <laughs>